When a man has a birthday, he sometimes takes a day off. When a woman has a birthday, she takes a year off. <laughs> Can you top that, Harry Hurtfield? I'll try. Can you, Ward Wilson? I'll make an effort. And you, Joe Laurie Jr.? Me too. <laughs> these, <laughs> these three wiseacres with the laughter makers bring you another session of Can You Top This? And now for our statistician with ambition who will make additions to your acquisition. That's Harvard for he's rash with cash. Roger Bauer. Good evening. Can You Top This? is unrehearsed and spontaneous, and our top rule is keep them laughing. Anyone can send in a joke, and if your joke is told by the well-known actor and storyteller Peter Donald, you get $10. Each of the three wits try to top it with another joke on the same subject. Each time they fail to top you, you get $5 more. Can You Top This is made possible by our fine sponsor. Won't you please listen to this? Oh, well, let's get on with the laughs. Are you ready, fellas? Ready. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Dubious tonight, eh? <laughs> our first joke this evening comes from Mr. Neg Nonet of Chicago, Illinois, and it's on the subject of something we'll be hearing a lot about in the near future, I imagine, politically, campaign. Campaign. So, uh, Peter Donald, you do a little trooping, and uh, we'll cast our vote for you. Well, a, a friend of mine, Larry Rhodes, was vacationing in Mexico not long ago, and he stopped at one of those those big swanky resorts down there, you know, like they have Acapulco and Chapultepec and Mocalea cake or whatever they have down there. <laughs> this was a very, very swanky, ritzy one. This place was known as Haka Overcoat, this place. <laughs> and it's a very swanky hotel. They even got neon peons there, you know. This kind of <laughs> So anyway, he's standing, he's standing down in the lounge one evening, and he gets talking with a, with a Mexican businessman. And he said, uh, tell me, sir, he said, uh, how's the political situation down there? So the Mexican says, ah, senor, he says, I wish you could have talked with my friend Juan. He's my best friend, Juan. Oh, he says, this uh, friend of yours, Juan, he's uh, interested in politics? Oh, si, senor. Juan, he make big campaign. Juan, he run for city council, and he make it. Then Juan, he run for presidente, and he make it. And then Juan, he run for the border, and he no make it. <laughs> now, he says, what do you mean? What happened to your friend Juan? He says, senor, it's very sad happening. You see, the opposition, they shoot Juan with a golf gun. He said, a golf gun? I never heard of that. They, they shot your friend Juan with a golf gun? What on earth is a golf gun? He says, well, senor, all I know is they make a hole in Juan. <laughs> You had an ace yourself that time, Pete. One thousand on the laugh meter, Ward. You're very solidly putting yes. Mr. Nonet in for twenty-five dollars automatically, and uh, putting our three wits at a very great disadvantage. But we'll see if they can at least tie it anyway. And uh, Senator Ford had his hand up well, raised first. I'll take the first disadvantage. <laughs> but that that uh, that gag is uh, very reminiscent of another one. Up in my hometown, Aki Pop was talking to Titsy Palmwater, and he said. Um, Hey, Titsy, where was you on your vacation last year? And Titsy said, I spent my vacation in San Jose, California. So Aki said, San Jose? He said, you don't pronounce it that way, it's San Jose. Because J's are sounded like H's. He said, oh, well, in that case, I spent my vacation in San, uh, San Jose during the months of Hoon and Hulai. <laughs> One thousand on the laugh eater for that one, Ward. Was that uh, anything to do with campaign? <laughs> well, let me see now. <laughs> well, it was a campaign to teach Ditsy how to speak Spanish. But listen, I have a, another a gag that might fit in there. <laughs> Let's Matter try fact, that. I huh? have three or four that won't fit either. <laughs> I, I could tell this one about uh, Ditsy and Dopey this time. Dopey till Doc. Dopey is a pretty smart guy in a stupid sort of way. And one day he said to, to Ditsy, he says, Hey, he says, you know, I'm going into business. I've just gone into business. I bought a thousand William McKinley buttons for a penny apiece. Now I want to tell you, I'm going to make a fortune if William McKinley ever runs for president again. <laughs> Campaign buttons, you see. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, come to think of it, you... Uh... Come to think of it, you could tell I that one. Made it calendars. It might have been better. Than <laughs> well, uh, it was a little dated. Well, it looks like only four hundred on the laugh meter now, Ward. Well, let's take the one thousand. The first one. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think the thousand is much better. And uh, let's see if we can protect this as a perfect round and call on uh, Harry Hirschfield second. 
Of course, there are a lot of campaign stories, but my own favorite is the one about the fellow who went into politics for this first time, little Sam. First time he's running for alderman. But he finds out he's got a very tough opponent against him. So it necessitated making a lot of speeches. And this one day, he made about 60 speeches. And he's coming home at 3 o'clock in the morning in the rain and the sleet after making campaign speeches, discouraged with life, tough opponent, when a good angel suddenly appeared. Says, you can have any wish and I can help you. He says, I could use the help. Any wish, he said, any wish you want, you can have. But with one proviso, anything you wish for yourself, your opponent will get twice as much. He said, let me get this right. Whatever I wish, my opponent will get twice as much. He says, yes. He said, for my wish, leave me just like I am. I'm half dead. <laughs> the laugh meter registers 1,000 for that joke, Ward. Keeping our uh, <laughs> perfect round intact, and now it's right in the lap of little Joe Laurie Jr. Well, little Montgomery Epstein is coming out of the polling place, and he's walking out, his friend comes over to him and says... Voted? He says, yeah. So they're walking along. He says, who'd you vote for? He says, Lincoln. He says, Lincoln? You voted for Lincoln? He says, you dope you. He's been dead 75 years. He says, I don't know anything about it. I heard a man make a speech. He said, if you vote for us, you will have two cars in every garage. So I voted for a Lincoln and a Buick. <laughs> Joe, you should get a new car on the strength of that, and uh, you kept intact our perfect round. One thousand on the laugh meter, Ward. I can even the... take an old Buick. If you, get, yeah. if you get two cars, will you give me one? I'll let you run between them. <laughs> well, let's see Just as we minute. look around. What? Huh? Chrysler. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, you got yours already. <laughs> Gee whiz, I wish I could mention Packard. More fun, more jokes coming up in a minute after this word from our sponsor. You are contest of wit and humor now, and uh, here's a joke which was sent in by H.P. Newman of Chico, California, and the subject of this joke is rescue. Rescue. So, Pete, it's up to you to pull us out on this one. Well, I told about the Mexican resort. This is going a little north. You know, Harry Hirschfield just came back from a fishing trip up to Canada for a week, and he was up there at a, at a resort way up in Canada. It's a place called Lake Camp Catch a Trout up there, and he's <laughs> he had a good time, but it seems there was an Englishman... There was an Englishman on vacation up there, and he's sitting on the pier, and he's fishing. And he's having no luck at all. His worm is going crazy. It's wriggling and scaring all the fish away, all the other worms hanging nice and straight on the hook. His is making a nest of itself all the time. So it keeps scaring the fish. So he's there all day, and he's just getting ready to, ready to give up. And all of a sudden, a great big muskie comes along, and he grabs the worm. And the poor Englishman doesn't get a chance to grab his rod, and boom, pulls him in the water. So he's thrashing around. He says, help! I say, I can't swim. I shall submerge. Help! Help! <laughs> Save me, someone! So Harry Hirschfield, naturally, the outdoor boy, he comes tearing down. <laughs> <laughs> he comes tearing down. He dives in the water. and He pulls this Englishman up to shore. So he says, don't worry now. He says, you'll, you'll feel better. He says, let me work on you a little. You didn't swallow much water. I got to you in time. You'll be okay in a few minutes. So sure enough, in a few minutes, they... Britisher came around a little. He did feel a little better, and Harry says, gee, that's too bad, you know. You're up here for fun. That's a tough thing to have happen on your vacation. He said, I, I didn't notice everything that happened. He says, tell me, uh, how was it you came to fall in? The Englishman says, how did I come to fall in? I say, oh, boy, I didn't come to fall in. I came to fish. <laughs> One thousand on the lap meter, Ward. That uh, gives Mr. Newman $25 automatically, and for the second time tonight, you guys haven't a chance in the world, but you can make an effort. Uh, I have two hands up raised, uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and uh, give a listen to little Joe. Well, I, I think this is a story that was told for, by every great monologist in the world uh, for the past 75 or 100 years, I think. I don't go back. Did they tell it 100 years ago, Harry? Well, you'll hear it. <laughs> Well, I have to know But I know it's, it's a real old story, and it's about rescue just fits. It's about this uh, Scotchman and his boy. 
The Scotchman is on the beach. It's 200 and... years old. <laughs> <laughs> and the Scotchman is on the beach, and the kid is playing in the water. And suddenly, the kid goes out, and the fella dives in, gets him, and he brings him out after a struggle. He brings him out and brings him to his father. His father says, what's the matter? He says, why, your boy, your boy just fell in the ocean. He almost drowned. He says, I brought him in. He says, you brought him in? He says, yeah. He says, where's his hat? <laughs> it's a well, slow take, but it's... if it was uh, 200 years ago, it deserves it, Joe. The last meter registered 800 for that one, Ward. Well, that got him a stage, then. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, while you go back to retrieve the hat... I know hat, a better rescue gag than that. You do? Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think I got another one. You must know about another the, about one. About swimming, too. About the fellow says, I've got to confess to you, Gertie. He says, you know, it's years now. He says, you remember how we met? He says, you were hollering help and everything, and I dove in and it saved you? He says, well, i got to confess to you. She says, what? He says, you weren't in no danger, you know. He says, the water was only up to your neck. She says, I know it, Jim. All the time I was hollering help, he says, I had one foot on a sand. <laughs> so he says, where's the hat? <laughs> sort of sorry you thought of that one, Joe. But uh, we'll skip blithely past it and uh, see what Harry Hirschfield has to offer. Well, I have one on the subject of rescue. I think this is a goofy new sort of a moron story. <clears throat> a girl fell in love with this moron and her husband, father couldn't understand why she would want this moron. So he found out that they were eloping to a certain little town, and he got his automobile. He had a saver before she could marry this guy. But he came there too late. They were married. And made the old man so sore that he hauled off and smashed her in the jaw and knocked her down. She started to holler. With that, the groom took a smash at her, too. Then she got up and hollered. The father took another smash at her, and the groom smashed her. The father smashed, and the groom smashed her. And finally, a policeman ran and said, What's going on here? And the groom says, he got a nerve. If he can smash my wife, I can smash his daughter. Hey, 1,000 on the laugh meter for that one, Ward. <laughs> and, uh, let's see, Senator Ford hasn't been heard from in this round. <laughs> no, I, I was just thinking, uh... You know, a pipe cleaner is a hairpin with long underwear. It's got nothing to do with the thing at all. I was just thinking about it. Did you bring his hat? Well, anyway, uh, Sam... Uh, I, I don't know if this comes under the head of rescue or not. I think so, anyhow. Sam Bunbottom was down in his cellar holding his hand over a leaky water pipe. And all of a sudden, his wife from upstairs hollered, Sam, you can let go of the pipe now. He said, is the plumber here? She said, no, the house is on fire. <laughs> The last meter registers 600 for that joke. You mean it was better than the hat? (laughs) (laughs) Didn't bring the hat or no hat. And uh, as I gaze around the room and look at the figures, I see that none of our three wits have topped Mr. Newman's original 1,000. So the glad tidings are that we send Mr. Newman $25 of the... Now, our next joke comes from Roy Devaney of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And uh, the subject of this round is something I don't know whether you're familiar with or not from uh, just listening to you. Music. Music. So uh, I hope you arrive at a happy note, Peter. It seems that a, a very famous maestro is leading a large symphony orchestra, and he's conducting them in, in uh, Nick Kenny's fourth, that some of you may notice. <laughs> Opus 62, part five, lower eight, car 16. <laughs> this is better known as the Chibaba Chibaba movement from Chibaba of Seville. It's a thing they play. So he's... He's going along and he's conducting this thing and it's going great. And all of a sudden, he hears one violin in the string section. Magnificent. This dulcet tone of the violin comes out above all the others. So he looks over and there's this violinist playing away beautifully. And he's got such a sad kisser. He's a little woe-begone, looks awful. So the maestro stopped all the music. He said, my good man, he said, is that you playing so beautifully on the violin? Well, he says, well, who did you think it was? Yasha Hatfoots or somebody? <laughs> well, he says, what tone, what execution. You're wonderful. He says, thank you. Well, he said, how long have you been playing violin like that? Oh, he says, I've been playing 33 years already. He says, I was, I was playing years ago 
I knew the overture of 1812 before it was marked down from 1875. <laughs> it's 33 years I've been playing on this fiddle. The fellow says, well, it's marvelous, but you look so sad. Aren't, aren't you feeling well today? He says, believe me, inside I'm the picture from health. Never felt better in my life. Well, he said, do you have any troubles at home? He says, believe me, it says, I got a wonderful family. I got gorgeous kiddies. He says, I got money in the bank. I got a house in the country. I got two cars, a coupe and a lousy mini I got. He says, everything is A number one Yankee Doodle Ipsy Pipsy with me. <laughs> well, then he says, why do you sit there playing your violin and looking so miserable? He says, why do I look miserable? Because, confidentially, I just don't like music. <laughs> well, that laugh should be uh, music to Mr. Devaney's ears anyway, Peter. was 1,000 on the laugh meter. Sort of uh, like a firecracker tonight, kind of hot. That's the third time you've zinged up there, uh, giving Mr. Devaney an automatic $25 and once again taxing our three wits to the utmost. All three hands up, too. That was, well, we know about music, don't you hear us sing? <laughs> Valiant fellas. Well, I'll take note of Senator Ford first. Well, uh, Titsy and Dopey did all right for me in the first uh, thing. I think I'll try him again. Titsy and Dopey were talking about music and talking about opera and... Uh, Titsy said to Dopey, do you know anything about opera? He said, sure, I know all about Faust. What do you mean you know all about Faust? He said, well, I know Washington played in it. So what do you mean Washington played in Faust? He said he was Faust in war, Faust in peace, and Faust in the war. <laughs> well, One thousand on the left meter. Played Faust and slow too. <laughs> that was the German version of wa- wa- hole in one. <laughs> Did he bring his hat? Uh, let's see now. Uh, we have a perfect round going again. Let's see uh, if anybody's going to spoil it. Harry Hirschfield, I think, was second. Well, uh, this is a kind of a screwball gag I heard the other day. It'll fit the subject. There was a boarding house that had one bathroom, and all had to wait turns to get their baths. And sometimes you had to wait a long time to get your baths. But, you know, it had no lock on the bathroom door, so they had to sing while they were there to keep everybody warm. But it ended up in a fight, and a guy was brought to court for smashing the other guy. He just says, what happened? He says, well, I started to go to the bathroom to get a bath, and I heard singing in there. I came back half an hour later, still singing in there. I don't mind waiting two hours. I don't mind waiting three hours. But when a guy goes in there with a portable radio and puts women's voices on, that's too much. Well, it really isn't too much, but just enough, Harry. One thousand for that joke, Ward. Keeping our perfect round intact and uh, tossing it right over to Joe Laurie Jr. Well, a little German fella just come over and he just got, just bought knows the language and he gets a job in a music shop. So he's there a little while and a man comes in and he says, uh, I beg your pardon, he says, uh, have you got a fife? He says, yes, and three kids, too. <laughs> he says, you misunderstand it. He says, uh, that, that isn't it. He says, a fife is a long, tin thing. He says, oh, that's my wife. You saw it with my own eyes, Joe. Listen, I just got even. That's older than the hat game. <laughs> And you're not kidding. One thousand on the left meter. You're giving us another perfect round. But uh, Mr. Devaney will be very happy to know that as a result of the valiant efforts of our three wits, none were able to top his original one thousand. Another round of jokes will be coming up right after these important words from our fine sponsor. Back on the beam again, men. Here's a joke sent in by Paul W. Siebes of New York City. And it's on the subject of something we all should uh, take cognizance of. Caution. Caution. So, uh, Peter, throw it to the air. Well, it seems that <clears throat> Michael Houlihan is starting off to work in the morning, and his wife says, Now, Michael, now I want you to come home early tonight. Now, you don't want you stopping off at Halligan's High Bunny and Hacienda with all your bum friends down there. You're always in there with them. And you're always staying out late. Now, I don't want any of that tonight. Well, he said, Maggie, he said, after all, a man gets through his work, he should have a little relaxation. I, I may have just a couple of snorts and then one for the road. She said, ah, that's where the trouble starts. I don't mind one for the road, but you keep repaving it all the time. <laughs> she says, no, I, it's not good enough. I have to sit here all day long, and I'm working in the house, and then at night I'm all by myself in here, making nice things for you with me nothing needles. 
It's just nutting needles. You mean knitting needles. She says, these are nutting needles. I ran out of wool yesterday. Now, now, don't give me no argument. Now, I'm just telling you I want you to come home tonight. Well, he says, what's so special about tonight? She says, because the landlord is going to finally paint the stairs, and you've got to be home before he starts. Well, he agreed to this, and he goes off to work, and coming back, he stops in at the Halligan's place, and he stays a little long, and he has one for the road, and then he has... One for the Burma Road and Fordham Road and the road to Mandalay, and he gets a little late, and finally he comes home, and the lights are all out, and he opens the door, and he smells paint. So he tries to switch, and the lights won't work. Oh, he said, this is awful. Now, what am we going to do? How am I going to get upstairs? Oh, what'll he do? Oh, you know what I'll do? He says, I'll shinny up the banister. So he grabs his suitcase and he starts to climb up the banister. He's crawling up and it takes him about an hour to go a couple of inches. He's crawling up. He gets halfway up and he drops the suitcase. It makes a big thud and his wife hears him. She says, Michael, is that you down there? He says, it is. Why aren't you asleep? Well, she says, I stayed awake to tell you. You can come right up the stairs because the landlord didn't bring enough paint so all he painted was the banisters. <laughs> picture with that one, too, for the fourth time tonight. 1000 on the Laugh Meter Awards, automatically giving him $25. And uh, you fellas are out just for laughs once again, and uh, I think Harry Hirschfield had his hand up first. A very thin guy like Joe Spice. <laughs> the German Spice. One little weak guy came to a physical culture guy. I said, I'd like to let something get a little strength. Maybe you could give me some stuff to get some strength. Tell me something. So the fellow says, well, I got a series of exercises for you. Here's when you bend and when you don't bend. You do this to this and you twist here and all these exercises. And you can do it right in your house. I said, all right, I'll try it. As he got towards the door, he says, and I've got to caution you about one thing. You must do all those things in front of an open window. He says, why do you think I came here to get some strength? I can't lift the window. <laughs> One thousand on the Laugh Meter Award. <laughs> so, uh, he give you credit for uh, one grand and uh, skip lightly over to Senator Ford. Well, um, <laughs> uh, little Oscar Potts and Goggle was using some, uh, was using some words that his mother didn't think was becoming a young boy, and she said, I don't want you to use any language like that again. He said, why not William Shakespeare used it? She said, if William Shakespeare used it, don't play with him anymore. <laughs> One thousand on the laugh meter. The laugh meter registers one thousand for that joke, Ward. Uh, not a solid one, however, but it counts just the same, and uh, let's see. Joe Laurie is yet to be heard from. Yeah, well, uh, Montgomery uh, learned to be a pilot, see? And he got enough lessons, so he bought a little two-passenger two job, and he took his wife up. He says, the first time I'm up alone with you, he says, we'll take a trip. So they fly around, and he's doing pretty good, and finally there's a storm and everything. He turns to his wife, he says, uh, Chin Chin. <laughs> he says, have you got that uh, five-carat stone, the diamond ring I bought you last year? You're wearing it? She says, no, I didn't take it. He says, have you got that sunburst I got you? The $2,000 sunburst? Are you wearing that? She says, no, I'm not. I left it home. He says, that tiara I bought you, that $6,000 tiara, you wearing it? He says, no, I left it home. He says, oh, are you lucky? She says, why? He says, because we're going to crash. <laughs> so she says, where's the hat? <laughs> that hat seems to still be pursuing you, Joe. Eight. 150 on the laugh meter for that joke, Ward. Can't, just Can't get any more out of it. But uh, you're in sort of a futile cause there anyway. None of our three wits were able to top Mr. Sieb's 1,000. Well, a look at the clock shows the time has wasted, gentlemen. So I'd just like to ask the audience to join Can You Top This? Originated by Senator Ford next week. Same time, same gang, other jokes, some new, some old. Until then, we remain yours for bigger and better laughs. Edward Ford. Harry Hirschfield. Joe Laurie Jr. Peter Donald. Ward Wilson. And this is your host, Roger Bauer, saying so long. And take care of yourself until we meet again next time.